hip-hop newcomer, whose real name was Jose Onfroy, was shot about 40 miles north of Miami at a motorcycle dealership in Deerfield Beach. In the world of hip-hop, where beats collide with poignant lyrics, tales of triumph and tragedy often intertwine. From its inception, the genre has been a reflection of the streets, echoing the struggles and triumphs of those who call them home. Yet, amid the rhythm and rhyme, a darker narrative emerges, one marred by violence. In today's video, we uncover the lives and legacies of six dangerous rappers whose stories embody the tumultuous intersection of music, fame, and crime. From street battles to legal entanglements, these rappers navigated through a world of controversy, leaving behind a trail of notoriety and intrigue. Number one, King Von. Born and raised in the Parkway Garden homes of the south side of Chicago, King Von, whose real name was Davon Daquan Bennett, was intimately familiar with the harsh realities of street life. Growing up in the 6,400 block of South Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, a neighborhood infamously known as O Block, King Von was exposed to the harsh realities of street life from an early age. The area had gained its notorious reputation after the 2011 killing of Odie Perry, a member of the Black Disciples Gang. O Block became synonymous with danger as it witnessed the highest number of shootings in Chicago between 2011 and 2014. It was within this environment that Dave Vaughn, later known as King Vaughn, would find himself drawn into the world of gangs. From a young age, King Vaughn found solace and expression in music. He was drawn to the drill music scene, a subgenre of hip hop that originated in Chicago and focused on the raw and gritty experiences of life in the inner city. The drill genre became a platform for artists like King Vaughn to share their stories and shed light on the harsh realities of their neighborhoods. King Vaughn's involvement in the drill music scene wasn't just a about the music. It mirrored the life he was living. Deeply entrenched in street culture and gang activities, his lyrics painted vivid pictures of the violent struggles and triumphs he witnessed firsthand. As King Vaughn grew older, his involvement in criminal activities became more frequent. Speculated to be affiliated with the Black Disciples, he found himself in and out of jail, facing various charges ranging from drug possession to more serious offenses. These legal troubles would become a recurring theme throughout his life, casting a shadow over his promising music career. Unfortunately, King King Vaughn's involvement in criminal activities not only affected his own life, but also caused pain and turmoil within his community and beyond. The consequences of his actions rippled through the neighborhoods of Chicago, leaving devastation in their wake. In April 2014, King Vaughn found himself under police scrutiny as a person of interest in the tragic shooting of 17-year-old Gangster Disciples member Gakira K.I. Barn. However, despite being questioned, authorities couldn't bring charges against him due to inconsistencies in witness testimony. Just a few months later, on July 24, 2014, 14, King Von's life took a dramatic turn when he was arrested in connection with another shooting incident that occurred in May of the same year. This incident resulted in the death of Malcolm Stuckey and left two other men injured. Each of these tragic deaths not only robbed individuals of their futures, but also inflicted lasting trauma on their loved ones and the wider community. In 2019, King Von and fellow Chicago rapper Lil Durk found themselves at the center of a high-profile case. Five in the morning on February 5th, Lil Durk, whose real name is Dirk Derek Banks, and his co-defendant, Devontae Bennett, were seen on camera involved in shooting Alexander Witherspoon, a person police say they knew. The incident occurred on one fateful day in Atlanta, Georgia, on February 5th. The Varsity, a busy drive-in restaurant, was filled with people enjoying their food and the lively atmosphere. But little did they know, things were about to take a bad turn. Among the crowd were rappers King Vaughn and Lil Durk, both speculated members of the Black Disciple Gang. As the evening went on, tensions rose, and a fight broke out between Alexander Witherspoon, a man with a troubled past, and King Vaughn and Lil Dirk. Though the details are unclear, witnesses say things got heated fast, leading to gunfire, with Witherspoon getting hit. King Vaughn and Lil Dirk were both charged with the shooting of Alexander Witherspoon and an alleged robbery of stealing Alexander's Jeep Cherokee and $30,000 in cash. The incident shed light on the violent nature of their gang affiliation and the criminal activities associated with the Black Disciples. Tragically, on November 6, 2020, King Vaughn's life was cut short in a shocking incident. 26-year-old Devon Bennett, also known as Ralph rapper King Vaughn shot and killed after a deadly fight erupted in front of Monaco Hookah Lounge. It all began with a heated dispute between two groups, the details of which remained shrouded in speculation. As tensions flared, emotions ran high, and the situation quickly spiraled out of control. The argument reached a boiling point, and before anyone could intervene, gunshots rang out, shattering the night's tranquility. Tragically, King Vaughn was one of the victims caught in the hail of bullets. The violence associated with King Vaughn's criminal activities contributed to the already high levels 
levels of crime and insecurity in the south side of Chicago. His participation in shootings and other violent incidents perpetuated a cycle of retaliation and retribution, further endangering the lives of innocent bystanders caught in the crossfire. Overall, King Von's criminal activities inflicted immeasurable harm and nuisance on his community. While his music may have reflected the realities of street life, the consequences of his actions left a legacy of pain and suffering that extended well beyond his music career. Number two, Old Dirty Bastard. Old Dirty Bastard, born Russell Tyrone Jones on November 15, 1968, in the Fort Greene section of Brooklyn, New York City, had a childhood filled with both struggles and aspirations. Growing up in a neighborhood plagued by poverty and crime, he found solace in rap music and martial arts style movies. Alongside his cousins Robert Diggs and Gary Grice, Old Dirty Bastard formed the group force of the Imperial Master, which later became known as All In Together Now. Little did they know that their musical journey would lead to the formation of one of the most influential rap groups of all time, the Wu-Tang Clan. In 1993, the Wu-Tang Clan released their debut album, Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, which introduced the world to their raw and gritty sound. Old Dirty Bastard's unique style and outrageous rhymes quickly made him a standout member of the group. His half-rap, half-sung delivery and free associative lyrics set him apart from his peers, earning him a reputation as one of hip-hop's most eccentric and unpredictable artists, the Dirty Version. The album was a critical and commercial success, propelled by hit singles like Brooklyn Brooklyn Zoo and Shimmy Shimmy Ya. Old Dirty Bastard's unfiltered and unapologetic approach to his music resonated with audiences, solidifying his status as a hip-hop icon. While Old Dirty Bastard's rise to fame was marked by his unique style and captivating music, his personal life was plagued by a series of legal troubles that would ultimately overshadow his career. From failure to pay child support to drug possession and assault charges, his run-ins with the law became increasingly frequent and had a profound impact on his life. In 1993, Old Dirty Bastard, a prominent figure in the rap scene faced his first brush with the law. Convicted of second-degree assault for an attempted robbery, the incident marked the beginning of a series of legal troubles that would plague his life and career. Just a year later, in 1994, he was shot in the abdomen following an argument with another rapper, adding a violent chapter to his rap sheet. As the years passed, Old Dirty Bastard's legal entanglements only intensified. In 1997, he was arrested for failure to pay child support for three of his children, underscoring the personal and financial toll of his actions. The following year, in 1998, he pleaded guilty to attempted assault on his wife and became the victim of a home invasion robbery, sustaining gunshot wounds in the process. But old dirty bastard's run-ins with the law didn't end there. In July 1998, mere days after surviving the home invasion, he was arrested for shoplifting, a seemingly petty crime that hinted at deeper issues. His behavior became increasingly erratic, leading to confrontations and additional arrests for criminal threatening in Los Angeles shortly thereafter. In a particularly alarming incident, old dirty bastard found himself facing serious charges of attempted murder and criminal weapon possession during a traffic stop. Though the case was later dismissed, it underscored the escalating nature of his legal woes and the potential danger he posed to himself and others. The turn of the millennium brought no respite from Old Dirty Bastard's troubles. In October 2000, he made headlines by escaping from a court-mandated drug treatment facility, becoming a fugitive from justice. During his time on the run, he brazenly appeared at public events, defying law enforcement and flaunting his disregard for authority. However, his escapade came to an end when he was apprehended outside a McDonald's in Philadelphia drawing attention to himself while signing autographs. Subsequently, he faced the consequences of his actions, receiving a two to four year sentence for his evasion of the law. Despite his incarceration, Old Dirty Bastard's legal woes continued to haunt him even after his release on parole in 2003. Tragically, on November 13, 2004, Old Dirty Bastard passed away at the age of 35. His death was attributed to an accidental drug overdose, highlighting the devastating consequences of his struggles with addiction. In 2012, details of his criminal history were revealed in his FBI file, which included allegations of connections to murders, a shootout with the New York City Police Department, and involvement in a racketeer-influenced and corrupt Organizations Act investigation against the Wu-Tang Clan, further tarnishing his reputation and legacy in the world of hip-hop. Despite his troubled life and legal battles, Old Dirty Bastard's impact on hip-hop and his contributions to the genre cannot be overlooked. Number three, Antron Singleton. Out of the rappers on this list, Antron Singleton's story stands out as one of the most horrifying. Born on September 15, 1976, in Dallas, Texas, Singleton had a troubled upbringing that would eventually shape the course of his life. From a young age, Singleton found solace in writing poetry, using words as an outlet for his emotions. Little did he know that this passion would lead him down a path that would ultimately end in tragedy. Singleton's journey into the world of hip-hop began when he joined the group Cosmic Slop Shop. Formed in the late 1990s, the group consisted of talented artists 
artists who shared a common love for music and a desire to make their mark in the industry. Singleton's raw talent and unique style quickly caught the attention of his fellow group members, and he became an integral part of the Cosmic Slop Shop. The group's debut album, Day Family, released in 1998, showcased their distinctive sound, blending elements of Southern hip-hop, gangster rap, and horrorcore. It was a fusion that resonated with audiences and garnered critical acclaim. Cosmic Slop Shop seemed destined for success, with Singleton's lyrical prowess and captivating stage presence captivating fans across the nation. However, as is often the case in the music industry, success was short-lived. Internal conflicts and personal struggles plagued the group, leading to their eventual disbandment in 1999. The dream of Cosmic Slop Shop came crashing down, leaving Singleton to navigate the uncertain waters of a solo career. Undeterred by the group's dissolution, Singleton embarked on a solo journey, determined to make a name for himself in the rap game. He poured his heart and soul into his music, channeling his emotions and experiences into his lyrics. But just as his solo career was gaining momentum, tragedy struck, forever altering the course of his life. In 2002, Singleton's life took a dark and horrifying turn. He committed a heinous crime that shocked the nation and left a permanent stain on his name, Tynisha Isaias. 21-year-old aspiring artist shared an apartment with Singleton in Los Angeles, California. On that fateful night, tragedy unfolded within the confines of their shared living space. Isaias was found dead by a friend who made a horrifying discovery. Her chest had been torn open and a three-inch blade was found broken off in her scapula. Teeth marks were visible on her face and lungs, which had been brutally ripped from her chest. The friend's testimony during the trial painted a chilling picture of the aftermath. Singleton was found naked and covered in blood, standing on the street, seemingly in a trance-like state, staring at the sky. It was a scene that defied belief and left those who witnessed it in a state of shock and disbelief. The investigation into the murder revealed a disturbing truth. Singleton had consumed human flesh, which did not belong to him, as evidenced by the medical examination that found human flesh in his stomach. This shocking revelation added another layer of horror to an already gruesome crime. The legal proceedings that followed were filled with tension and disbelief. Singleton pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, claiming that his use of PCP the night before the murder had put him in a psychotic state. His defense argued that his intoxication and claimed insanity were sufficient reasons to absolve him of responsibility for the crime. However, the court rejected Singleton's plea, ruling that his intoxication and alleged insanity were not satisfactory reasons for committing committing such a heinous act. The district attorney argued that drug use could not be used as grounds for an insanity plea in California, and the judge agreed. The court deemed Singleton fully accountable for his actions, and the weight of the evidence against him was overwhelming. On June 17, 2003, Singleton was convicted of murder and aggravated mayhem. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole on November 7, 2003. Many people have speculated Singleton has died or is still in prison. Regardless, his removal from society brings a sense of relief and safety to those who knew of his horrific crimes. Number four, Andre Hicks. Andre Lewis Hicks, famously known as McDre, was born on July 5, 1970, in Oakland, California. His parents, Alan Hicks and Wanda Salvato, later moved to the East Vallejo area, where Andre spent his formative years. Despite not actually living there, he frequently visited and claimed the country. Club Crest neighborhood, known as the Crest, as his own. Even as a student at Vallejo's Hogan High School, Andre Hicks showed his outgoing nature and passion for music. In 1989, he made waves with a cassette tape featuring his single, Too Hard for the F*** Radio. This early release showed showcased his unique sound, characterized by fast and confident delivery, and built upon the bouncy bass that had its roots in the funk era. It was during this time that Andre adopted the stage name MC Dre, but he soon altered it to McDre in 1984. He felt that the name MC Dre sounded too East Coast-ish and wanted a moniker that better represented his West Coast roots. McDre's musical journey continued to evolve, and between 1988 and 1992, he recorded his first three extended play, EP, recordings. These early projects laid the foundation for his future success and showcased his his talent as a rapper, producer, and songwriter. During the early 1990s, a string of bank robberies gripped the community. Mac Dre was rumored to be associated with a gang responsible for the terrorizing spree, causing chaos throughout the area. The Crest neighborhood particularly drew law enforcement attention, leading to intense surveillance of its residents. Mac Dre, known for his outspoken nature, didn't shy away from addressing these actions in his music. Through his lyrics, he aimed to illuminate the situation and awaken the neighbors. As gangster rap gained popularity, law enforcement officials began scrutinizing the 
the lyrics of local rappers hoping to find evidence to support criminal cases. Mac Dre's music became a target, and his words were analyzed for any potential connections to illegal activities. On March 26, 1992, at the age of 21, Mac Dre found himself entangled in a conspiracy charge. While on a road trip to Fresno with friends, the car they were traveling in was surrounded by FBI agents and police officers. The police alleged that Mac Dre's friends were casing a bank, but changed their plans upon seeing a local news van in the bank's parking lot. During the questioning, Mac Dre maintained that he had not left the motel and had no knowledge of the alleged bank robbery plans. Despite his claims of innocence, he was charged with conspiracy to commit robbery. The evidence against him included a gun linked to the bank robberies found in his apartment months before his arrest and a recording where he was heard saying, shoot out the surveillance cameras. Mac Dre's trial became one of the most significant criminal trials in rap history as it highlighted the intersection of music and law enforcement. Despite his refusal to accept a plea deal, Mac Dre was ultimately convicted and sentenced to five years in federal prison. After his release from Lompoc Prison, Mac Dre was determined to make the most of his newfound freedom. He relocated to the Arden Arcade area of Sacramento in 1998, hoping to distance himself from the law enforcement scrutiny he had faced in Vallejo. During the early 2000s, Mac Dre's sound underwent a transformation that would prove to be influential in the emerging hyphy movement. Hi-Fi, characterized by its energetic and exuberant style, became a cultural phenomenon in the Bay Area hip-hop scene. Mac Dre's music played a pivotal role in shaping this movement, and his fast-paced rhymes and infectious beats inspired a new generation of artists. One notable collaboration during this period was with Atlanta rapper and producer Lil Jon. In 2019, Lil Jon released the single Ain't No Telling, which featured vocals from Mac Dre. This collaboration showcased the enduring impact of Mac Dre's music and his ability to transcend regional boundaries. Despite his burgeoning success, tragedy struck on November 1st, 2004. Following a performance in Kansas City, Missouri, Mac Dre and fellow members of Thiz Entertainment were traveling in a van along U.S. Route 71 when an unidentified gunman unleashed gunfire. The van's driver attempted to call 911 after crashing, but Mac Dre succumbed to a fatal bullet wound to the neck before help could arrive. The circumstances surrounding Mac Dre's murder remain shrouded in mystery, casting a shadow over his legacy. While many have speculated about gang rivalries as a potential motive, the case remains unsolved to this day. Number 5. Soldier Slim James Adaro Tapp Jr., better known as Soldier Slim, was born on September 9, 1977, in New Orleans, Louisiana. Growing up in the notorious Magnolia Projects, a housing development known for its high crime rates, Soldier Slim was exposed to a harsh and challenging environment from an early age. Raised by his parents, James and Linda Tapp, Soldier Slim faced numerous obstacles in his formative years. The Magnolia Projects, plagued by poverty and violence, provided a backdrop for his upbringing. Despite the difficult circumstances, Soulja Slim discovered his passion for music and began rapping at a young age. Attending Cohen Senior High School, Soulja Slim's education was cut short when he dropped out in the 11th grade. This decision marked a turning point in his life as he embarked on a path that would lead him down a dangerous and tumultuous road. After leaving school, Soulja Slim delved into the dangerous world of drug dealing, succumbing to the allure of quick money despite the inherent risks. His involvement in illicit substances extended beyond mere distribution as he found himself ensnared in the clutches of heroin and cocaine addiction, grappling with the devastating effects of substance abuse. Additionally, he became embroiled in the web of street violence, perpetuating a cycle of conflict that inflicted considerable pain and suffering upon his community. Soldier Slim's early experiences with crime and addiction would shape the trajectory of his life and ultimately influence his music. Despite the challenges he faced, Soldier Slim's talent as a rapper began to gain recognition within his community. He started performing at local venues and block parties in the Magnolia Projects, captivating audiences with his raw and authentic authentic style. His lyrical prowess and ability to tell stories through his music set him apart from his peers. Soldier Slim's talent did not go unnoticed. Legendary producer KLC, impressed by his skills, signed him to Parkway Pumpin', an independent record label. This marked a significant milestone in Soldier Slim's music career as he began recording his first tracks and collaborating with other artists in the industry. In 1994, Soldier Slim released his solo debut album, Soldier Fay Life, under Parkway Pumpin' and Hype Enough Records. The album garnered attention and success, selling an impressive 90,000 units independently. This early achievement served as a testament to Soldier Slim's talent and set the stage for his future in the music industry. However, the allure of the streets and the grip of addiction continued to haunt Soldier Slim. In the same year as his album release, he was convicted of armed robbery and sentenced to prison. His criminal actions not only disrupted his own life, but also had a ripple effect on his community. The negative impact of his crime was felt deeply as it perpetuated a cycle of violence and instability, further contributing to the social decay and mistrust within his neighborhood. 
neighborhood. Despite his incarceration, Soul Jaw Slim's music continued to make an impact. His raw and honest lyrics spoke to the realities of life in the streets, resonating with listeners who related to his experiences. During his time in prison, Soul Jaw Slim's music gained a cult following. His authenticity and raw storytelling captivated fans, who eagerly awaited his return to the music scene. In 2001, Soul Jaw Slim released his second album, The Streets Made Me, under the No Limit label. The album showcased his growth as an artist and featured collaborations with fellow rap artists. Following his release from prison, Soldier Slim took control of his own destiny. He started his own record label, Cutthroat Committee Records, and released his third album years later in late 2002. The album showcased his evolution as an artist and featured introspective tracks that delved into his personal struggles and growth. Tragically, years later would be Soldier Slim's last album before his untimely death. On that fateful day, Soldier Slim was shot and killed in front of his mother's home in the Gentilly neighborhood of New Orleans. The assailant fired four shots, three of which struck Soljaw Slim in the face and one in the chest. The motive behind the murder remains unclear, but it is believed to be connected to the ongoing gang violence and rivalries within the music industry. Number six, Gakira Barnes. In the heart of Chicago's South Side, rapper Gakira Barnes grew up amidst the harsh realities of poverty, crime, and gang activity. From an early age, Gakira was exposed to a world that would shape her destiny in ways unimaginable. Standing at just five foot three and weighing 128 pounds, she may have seemed unassuming, but beneath her shy demeanor lay a fierce determination that would earn her a notorious reputation. Gakira's journey into the dark underbelly of gang violence began during her teenage years. While many girls her age were focused on school and dreams of a brighter future, Akira found herself drawn to the allure of the streets. It was within the ranks of the notorious gangster disciples that she would find her place, becoming a member of a faction known for its ruthless tactics and fierce loyalty. As a member of the gangster disciples, Akira quickly earned the nickname K.I., an abbreviation of her first name. She embraced the lifestyle with a fervor that surprised those who knew her as a shy and timid girl. Akira's involvement with the gangster disciples was not without its consequences. She soon found herself embroiled in the tit-for-tat violence that plagued the streets of Chicago. The gangster disciples and their rivals engaged in a deadly dance of retribution. Each act of violence met with an equally brutal response. Gakira, with her reputation as a hitter, became a lightning rod for conflict, drawing the attention of both law enforcement and rival gang members. Law enforcement sources believed that Gakira was responsible for multiple shootings, including at least one murder. The streets whispered of a much higher body count, with rumors suggesting her involvement in as many as 15 shootings. Her alleged prowess with a gun struck fear into the hearts of those who crossed her path. She was known to act with such swagger that she was sometimes mistaken for a boy, a testament to her audacity and the power she held within the gang. As the violence between the gangster disciples and their rivals escalated, Gakira Barnes found herself at the center of a storm. Her reputation as a feared hitter and her involvement in the ongoing gang warfare made her a target, both from rival gang members and even her own faction. The tragic events that unfolded in Gakira's life would ultimately lead to her untimely demise, leaving behind a legacy shroud in violence and unanswered questions. Gakira's bravado and audacity were on full display on social media platforms, particularly Twitter, where she openly taunted her enemies. In March 2014, when a Chicago police officer shot and killed one of her friends during a foot chase, Gakira sent a chilling warning to the police, stating, DA police, I'd you faster than then on Duck Corner. Her post during this time reflected a sense of paranoia and the realization that people were gunning for her as she wrote, I got trying to off me, put me in a coffin. On April 11th, 2014, the streets of Woodlawn became the backdrop for a tragedy that would forever change the narrative of Gakira's life. In a shooting and she was shot multiple times and so the police thought that uh, she was targeted. On that fateful day, a hooded gunman approached Gakira in front of a home in the 6,400 block of South Eberhardt and opened fire, striking her seven times. Two young men were also wounded in the attack, but it was clear that Gakira was the intended target. The police sources believed that even her own gang wanted her gone, considering her a lightning rod for violence. The investigation into Gakira's murder yielded few leads, and no one has been taken into custody for the crime. The streets remained silent, with witnesses unwilling to come forward and provide information that could lead to justice. Gakira's death left a void in the community, further fueling the speculation and rumors surrounding her alleged involvement in gang violence. The story of Gakira Barnes serves as a stark reminder of the the devastating consequences of gang warfare. Her life was a reflection of the desperation and hopelessness that can consume individuals growing up in neighborhoods plagued by violence. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed watching this video, click on one of the boxes playing on your screen to watch more similar content.